Well, good evening. Uh, thank you for allowing us into your homes this evening. I am Dimakazo Mulantwa. I am the founder of Amari Marketing and Communications. I will be facilitating tonight's conversation on becoming men. The conversation is based on a book written by Professor Malose Langa. Um, and I'd like to encourage you to use social media to extend the conversation with us using the hashtag becoming men and tagging at amari marketing.co.za. Um, and before we before we start, um, I think it would be great for us to look at some of the definitions that are used in the book after I introduce the panelists that we have today. We are very honored to have two in, four incredible minds in front of us. I'll be introducing them individually so that you know who will be addressing us this evening. We have Dr. Mashohonolo Tobani. You can find her at Muduka 2018. She is a senior lecturer in the College of Law, Department of Criminology and Security Science. She holds a Bachelor of Social Sciences in Psychology from the University of Pretoria and a Bachelor of Arts Honours degree in Criminology and Psychology from UNISA. She also holds a master's degree in criminology and she obtained a doctor of literature and philosophy in criminology in 2017. Dr. Matlokonolo is a senior researcher for the Gender, Health and Justice Research Unit at the University of Cape Town. She is currently conducting a five-year research project on local government governance to improve gender-based violence response. Um, Dr. Mashahonolo is also the founder of Muduga, a nonprofit organization that focuses on combating the scourge of gender-based violence in South Africa. Good evening, Dr. Mashahonolo Tobani. Good evening, Ms. Mulantwa. Thank you very much for that generous in introduction. How are you feeling tonight? I am happy to be here. Um, this is going to be a very difficult, but um, a conversation that needs to be had. So I'm, I'm happy that you've organized this webinar for us to meet here and talk about something that's really urgent and very important. So yeah, happy to be here. Thank you for honoring the invite. We also have Mr. Taban Plaka, um, who is at Tavang Tag on all social media platforms. Uh, Mr. Tavang is a Nelson is a Mandela Road scholar. Um, he holds a master's degree in clinical psychology from the University of Pretoria. He is the author of several books, including The Taxi Philosopher, Corrupting Versions, Selfie of the Soul, Focus and Flourish, as well as workbooks that are called The Love Adventure and Empires of the Mind. Um, together with his wife, Zanele Taka, they have established the creative hub Crazy Poetic Ministries. Mr. Taka is also a proud father of two young girls and a very happy husband. Good evening, Mr. Taban Taka. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much for being here. We have Reverend Munyani Kai. Um, you can find him at Munyani93 on Twitter. He is a minister of religion. He holds a master's in theology from the University of Pretoria as well. There's a lot of UP people on the panel tonight. He is currently pursuing his PhD in the Department of Systematic Theology, Philosophy and Ethics at the University of Pretoria. Black liberation theology, African liberation theology, sexual theology, and the science of religion are some of his many interests. The subject of toxic masculinity and other forms of oppressive or toxic theologies in society are issues he has focused on over his years of study. He is also a star football player. Good evening, Reverend Munyang Dai. Thank you very much. Uh uh Dima for the invite and for the for the for the intro. Uh, I'm also looking forward to the to the engagements and to indulge tonight 
with uh, our great and well knowledge panelist. Thank you very much. It's an honor to have you, sir. Um, last but definitely not least, we have Professor Maluse Langa. Um, he's a psychology senior lecturer in the School of Community and Human Development at the University of the Witwatersrand. He works at the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation as an associate senior researcher. His research interests include risk-taking behaviors amongst the youth, trauma of collective violence, and the psychology of masculinity in post-apartheid South Africa. He is the author of the book, Becoming Men, which is the inspiration for today's conversation. Good evening, Professor Maluse Langa. Hi, thanks, uh, Dimagato, um, for, for the invitation to be part of this Legno conversation. And good evening to my fellow panelists, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Perfect. Maybe let's start at the beginning and talk about what led you to writing a book like this, and also why did you choose the title Becoming Men? Yeah, I, I need to say this from, from the outset. I mean, that it, it was never part of my, my plan when I did this work in, in 2007 to write a book. And I need to say this publicly, uh, that the book happened accidentally. Uh, so when I went to Alexandra Township in 2007, the main aim was to do a research for a period of a, a month to two months. Mm -hmm. But I guess when you read the book, especially in terms of its like, you know, methodology, was basically, I mean, to talk to like, you know, very young boys about what it meant to be like a young boy in a new like, South Africa. But then what intrigued me uh, is that in talking to these young boys, their stories changed in the individual interviews and in the group interviews. And then given the fact that then I had two different stories from the same person, I then had to go back in trying to reconcile why two different stories were shared. And they, it's where the journey sort of like you know, began because in, in, in them, responding why two stories were told, it was quite evident that many of them were worried about what to share with like you know, other boys. And a lot of them then started talking about a lot of like you know, feelings of fear, uh, feelings of fear and feelings of anxiety and all kinds of like you know, feelings associated with being like a young, 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 young person. So, with the title, like, you know, Becoming Men, I could have easily said became men, because now uh, these young boys are men today. But the title is quite intentional in nature. That, in fact, no one is born a man, and obviously someone is like, what do you mean? And no one is born a woman. Mm -hmm. But there's always this confusion, I guess, in the, in the public that sex is conflated with the gender. Sex basically we are referring to like you no know, sex organs and a gender is a social like you no know, construct. So this is the construct that is culturally made, it is socially made, and one has to become a man or a woman. So the process of becoming a man, I argue in the book, you know, to say it is, it is highly painful, it is highly traumatic, and, and you read that in the book, how, how traumatic that process is, how emotional that process is, is how dehumanizing that process is, is, how alienating that process is. So 
the the whole argument of like you know why young boys or men engage in all kinds of risk taking behaviors it is rooted in the notion of what it means to be a male person what makes a man a man and i often do this experiment you go to any other man you go to any other young boy and you ask a very young boy at the age of like you know six and to say how do you know you are a boy you go to any other man you ask him to say how do you know you are a man and i'm sure tabang will, will, will chip in and and uh Matogono will also come in and even a uh, reverend that often a person will not immediately reply and you observe there's a bit of a pause when you ask this question to, an, to, to, to a man to a young boy there's always a pause and if you're to interpret that pause it is basically that you're asking me the obvious why ask me like an obvious like no question some get to a point where obviously i mean i'm, I'm not sure if the young people listen to this like no conversation they, they start checking if whether is everything still in place or not? You know, because you, you're asking something like, no, quite, quite obvious. But basically, is that being a man is something that is taken for granted. It is something that you don't need to talk about. It is something that you are like, you know, given. It's, it's a given. So why ask me like an obvious, like, no question? So often there will be a pause followed by a giggle. <laughs> And what the giggle demonstrates is that, look, I, I, have, I have nothing to say. I, are you really serious that you're asking me this, like, no question? Yeah. And then you say, yes. And it's like, I really don't know how to answer this question. So, so obviously, in the book, I theorize about being a man is characterized by a lot of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. It's characterized by a lot of, like, no anxiety. But if you, 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 you do the same experiment with women and young girls you know this young girl will give you a long worded answer to the question in fact this young girl will be very quick in answering that question and you'll see a difference and i i i ask the participants in this conversation to do this experiment with either young boys or young girls or women and men you will see a huge huge difference and obviously then in the book, in conclusion, I argue to say, being a male person, there's a burden that you, that you carry. Hence, now and then, you need to prove that you are a real man by engaging in all kinds of like, no risk-taking behaviors. But being a woman, you don't have to prove now and then to say, there is never even in, 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 in written literature a real woman but with men there's a real man not a real um, woman so there's that difference that's that's very profound prof but you also mentioned in your book that um and also in interviews that you've had that the responses that you get from these young boys when you ask them how do you know you're a boy who told you you're a boy there are some characteristic definitions that they use even at that young age and and it's when you see that obviously like i say it is it is it is it is a construct that is rooted in our communities in our societies because though these boys were between the age of like you know 11 12 already they had scripts of what it meant to be a boy so with the, this example that i'm giving you here you're talking about like you no know, four-year-olds and and maybe tabang as you have like you know, announced as a father of like you no know, two 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 girls, already at that age, the girl child would be saying, "No, daddy, I cannot play with this toy. It's for boys, and this is for girls, and everything." Mm -hmm. And hence, in the book, in in the conclusion, I argue to say all of us are complicit, you know, because now we want to talk about gender later, later in life, mm -hmm. you know, to say we'll, we'll get into into this conversation about like you no know, gender-based like you no know, violence. 
you know, the need for men to be nonviolent, uh, and and but but all these like you know, scripts of what it means to be a male or a female person gets learned at a very very young age. Already at a very young age, you go to a preschool. Boys will be saying, "No, I cannot be playing with 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 girls. Why? Because girls easily cry." And then this young boy is already saying, "I cannot cry. I cannot show my feelings and emotions." And and you see it at that level already is carrying this baggage of being like a male person mm. from a very young age. So if you, even with in in the book, though these boys were young, already they were carrying this baggage of what it means to be like a male person. Amazing, Mr. Tabang. Maybe if if we could bring you in here um, when we speak about how boys are then already at the age of four, they already have some sort of defined masculinity and they already know instinctively what the expectation from society of them is. How does that come about? Where does that come from? So, yeah, thank you for, for, for I suppose, the, the foundation that the, the prof has laid, you know. Um, I mean, my, my five-year-old is already talking about marriage, right? And... Um, <laughs> She's uh, planning weddings and she says she'll get married and, and all that. But obviously it's not something as a father that I would like her <laughs> to do. You know, where, does, where does she get it, right? So the, the literature tells us when, when you look at developmental psychology that uh, parents influence their children. But by the time of four, the people who also help influence your children are also their peers in society, right? So... By the time a child is four, they already have ideas uh, through the teachers, through the parents, through what they watch, um, that, oh, boys do this and girls do that, you know. Maybe later we can talk about, perhaps that's why there's also a move um, for when they want to create schools that have no uh, gender neutral schools, right? But because they've learned that by the time somebody's four, they already have a, ideas about men do this, men do that, and women do that. And the, the, the idea I also, I also wanted to, to, to bring across is that sometimes we think that we have ideas, um, and, and then it's often said that people don't have ideas, but ideas have people, right? So at some point, um, m to be a man, you had to do certain things. If we go back, back in history, perhaps it had to do with something maybe more physical. You know, you had to fight uh, fight lions and go hunt and, and do that. And then there's some time then the, the industrial age also comes about. And then, you know, you maybe you go to war, women go to the marketplace, you come back. And then now you have to, in a, in a sense, change um, from, from what it means. Then we can bring it to South Africa, what happened uh, with apartheid and, and all that. So at different stages, it may mean different things uh, to be a man. And so sometimes we're not mindful of that, that um, there's a social unconscious, there are these ideas up in the air. And sometimes we think we come up with them, but th there is a um, st stories that are perpetuated in movies and culture in, in the world that we find, and they are there in the air somewhere. And, and I think sometimes if we can be aware of that, then we might understand why then people struggle with these ideas. They think they have them, but they are there in the air. We can interrogate that later. And so lastly, maybe I had this idea before I got married. I thought in my mind, um, I was going to get married and then I was going to become a dog and I was going to cheat on my wife. I'm going to do something to her. Right. And, mm -hmm. but because at the time, okay, now the word is trash for now, but at the time the word was, was dogs, men are dogs. And mm. somehow I, I believe this is something I had in my mind until later I had to, to in, interrogate it. So I think what I want to bring across is that developmentally people are given ideas, but not by their parents, by their teachers. And I think that also comes up in the book by their teachers, by their peers as well. Children help socialize other children. So it's the little boys and the little girls who tell you, don't do that. Boys don't do this and girls do that. And then secondly, to, to also bear in mind that there are these ideas that are perpetuated through time and we somehow just take them apart or they, they are within us and we have to now deal with them. 
um, and then to, to, to match that. And perhaps when we talk later about perhaps we struggle with the transition, that mm -hmm. it meant to be at that age, at a certain stage, being a man meant this and that. But now being a man means this and, and that. So that's some of the things we need to look at. Um, it's, it's very interesting that you, you talk about the evolution of what, um, what meant being a, a man was and what it is now. And we'll talk about some of the things that come into mind when we, we look at how they have to handle matters differently, how priorities have changed. And sometimes the way that men are raised, boys are raised, does not complement the challenges that they have to face now. Um, if we could go to Reverend Munyanin Tai. Um, with theology and especially with religion, I mean, the assumption is if you're going to be a religious man, you're a good man. What does theology have to contribute to this conversation of masculinity and what's the standpoint there? If you can add me uh, this. Thank you very much, uh, Ausdima, uh, and thanks uh, to, to the prof for the introduction and the foundation, and also to Brother Tabang uh, for, that, for that background. But for me, really, uh, I, could, I could more or less relate with this uh, particular topic. You know, just by looking at the cover of the book, I can already judge the person that is uh, in front of the book because in one way or the other, uh, having grown up in Soweto, lived through these uh, stages, I know what it means, even <clears throat> the folding of the arms, you know, uh, we, we know what stage is that and what it means and the language uh, that particular post uh, seeks to, 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 to address. But as, as, as Prof has rightfully said, you know, everything is, 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 is socially constructed, uh, 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 even in the religious space, in the society at large. It's, it's socially constructed. But for me, really, it's, it's the question of uh, what, what kind of a society uh, is those socially constructed ideas uh, willing to, to, to produce. Because uh, for me, when I interpret, not only in the religious space, but when I int uh, interpret the issue of, you know, toxic hegemonies, uh, 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 I always take it back to history. Because I cannot speak about the boys in Soweto, the boys in Alex, the boys in Tembisa without really finding the, the social scientific uh, uh, context of, of what really went wrong or what really happened. So for me, I, 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 I individually believe that every generation is a product of the previous generation or generations. So if, if me and you have to take this back, Mm -hmm. You will know that the creation of uh, the locuses, you know, the, the townships, it was not out of a goodwill. Already the people who made sure that uh, they are township, they had an idea of the society that they want to have. And mm -hmm. coming to Soweto, because I grew up in Soweto, I can only speak of Soweto, but I know that our experiences are not so different from other townships outside of Seoul. But what I know about becoming a man in the context of a township, it meant no good at all to the architecture of those townships. So now, when we talk about uh, the toxic masculinities in this day and age, we always have to revert back to say, what was the aim and what, was, what is it that the people who created the locuses wanted to achieve? And me and you can agree here to say it meant no good. They, 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 the, the system 
be it apartheid, be it uh, colonialism, be it any form of oppression. It wanted to produce toxicities out of this uh, 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 township. So now when we see uh, uh, the birth of these different kinds of toxicities uh, 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 coming out of our locuses, uh, to me really I don't become surprised because that's what the locations, that's what the churches, that's what the, 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 the education system, that's what the, the, the media space of those times wanted to achieve. So to me, to, so to me it, is, it, is, it is the issue or the matter of saying, let us go back and understand uh, what is it that preempted the people who architected uh, apartheid, colonialism, and segregation. What did they want to achieve with location? And we see this coming out of this uh, 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 toxic hegemonic uh, masculinities. We see it uh, 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 with the coming of a violent society. That's what the township from the word go meant to present or to represent. So it's by design. It's by design. All right. Um, we have Ms. Vene Raja. She says, society has mainly operated on the basis that gender is binary. And so we have constructed our worlds accordingly. Now that same world is discovering so many other contrasts um, and is moving more and more towards gender neutrality, it becomes much more difficult for traditional communities to adapt to that. Um, Dr. Matlohono Lotobani, um, Reverend Dai said a word I, I read in this book the first time, and I think it's at this point that it would be maybe useful to define it. Um, and then afterwards, if you could just help us through um, any, any views you might have on this. So it's hegemonic masculinity. Um, and hegemonic means, I checked the dictionary because I did not know, it's <laughs> um, being ruling or dominant in a social context. So building on what Reverend Tai was talking about on how townships were designed to create toxic environments, um, and then looking at hegemonic masculinities, how can you bring them together? Okay, um, so as we've asked, for me to basically contextualize what um, hegemonic masculinity means or what um, toxic masculinity means, because that's, uh, that's what I'm going to focus on. Mm. So hegemonic masculinity basically means um, your gender socialization that focuses on the domination and subordination of between and within gender roles. So that basically means that, um, you know, when um, this happens only, it, it's not between male and female, but can happen between main, male and male, that the one male feels that I'm more man than you are. Because um, what happens is that, you know, like with issues of homophobia, for example, or maybe a boy who is more in touch with his feminine side, Another boy who feels that he's a bit more macho might feel that he's more dominant than the other boy. And then that can also be used where male and female are concerned, where males feel like they are dominant over females and that females are subordinate to males. So that's basically what um, hegemonic um, masculinity means. It's about dominance and subordination. But also you have what it's called a uh, toxic masculinity, which is an aspect of homogenic masculinity, which emphasizes basically what happens there is that it's socially destructive. You know, those socially destructive behaviors that we have adopted, those are your to toxic masculinities. So those are the two different terms that you need, we need to unpack before we can go on with the conversation. But on my side as a criminologist, what I want to focus mostly is on the toxic masculinities, which I explained that there those aspects of hemogenic uh, masculinity 
that promote violence. Um, so what I want to talk about mainly is um, on issues of gender-based violence, because um, there are many causes of gender-based violence, but there is one main cause. Another cause of gender-based violence is um, the harmful social norms or social gender norms. Where, um, so with social gender norms, you find that there's a lot of pro problematic norms that we are carrying forward. Um, I think the Rev or uh, Tabang spoke about the issue that about, you know, tradition, we evolve as human beings. So meaning that our tradition and culture also has to evolve. But in many instances, we are still carrying social gender norms or traditions which are outdated. And those can be very harmful. So um, let's talk about, for example, a male being a provider. It's a good thing for a male to be a provider, but at the same time, it can be toxic. In that, um, the minute a woman um, earns, for example, more than a man, then it becomes a problem because according to the society, the male is supposed to be the provider. Um, so those are the kind of toxic masculinities that can lead to gender-based violence or to violence in the society. And um, the, 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 the important thing that we need to also talk about, it's about the issue of socialization. Tavan spoke about it, that these um, ideas of what it is to be a man or what it is to be a woman, it's ideas that were constructed by the society. So that's why socialization is very important. And that is why when we raise men, or as Prophet said, becoming men, in this book, what he wants to happen is to motivate for the adoption of alternative and healthy masculinities. So that's, that's basically what um, we need to push forward, that you know what, um, there's a research that I'm doing on the detraditionalization of social norms. So the point of it is that we need to basically erase social norms that are toxic, social norms that perpetuate violence and replace them with positive norms. So the book itself and what Prof argues here is that through this book, he wants men to embrace healthy and alternative masculinities. And that's the problem that we are having at the moment that, you know, some men feel like they are men, they're not, uh, they are more men than other men because some men are not showing that masculinity. You know, you are not mature enough. You are not men enough. You need to fight to prove yourself that you're a man. And that is why we have so much violence because there's always that proving and want to dominate um, in order for you to be called a man or in order for you to feel that you have become a man. Yeah, so that's basically um, what I wanted to share on toxic, toxic masculinities in relation to violence as a criminologist. Thank you, Dr. Tomani. Those are very strong points, but they are also extremely challenging. I mean, changing and removing social norms that are toxic and replacing them with social norms that are not toxic might sometimes be subjective. For example, um, there is circumcision. Um, we had a, a write in um, Tayani. Tayani wrote in and he, he spoke about circumcision and how that was something that gave men or young boys bragging rights back in the day. And that ended up being their main masculine point. If you are not circumcised, I am a better man than you. And, and that became a point of concession. Another one could be things like lobola, where if it's considered in a healthy way, it is a gift that one family gives the other family, appreciating them for raising their bride. But also some men might use that as an opportunity to say, I paid so much money for you, you get to do whatever I tell you to do. Um, and in Prof Maluse's, in, in, in the book that we have here, becoming men. Prof, you speak of uh, damages um, where a, a, a woman gets pregnant out of wedlock and damages need to be paid if the woman's family goes to the man's family and how some men have decided to not claim the child just on the basis that they could not afford to pay damages. So 
on the subject of removing toxic uh, social norms, how do we decide where, which ones are definitely toxic and they need to be removed? And who does that? Prof, maybe if you come in here. Please unmute. Thanks very much, um, Dimagato. Um, and 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 obviously, I mean, I I want to pick up on few points that have been ventilated by my fellow like you know, panelists, uh, and then I'll come back to to your question. Quick, quick, quickly, I, I I fully agree that I mean the, this conversation at times can become highly, highly philosophical, can become highly, highly intellectual. But in fact, we're dealing with a very simple, simple matter, a sim simple issue. And, and you see it in a in number of like, you know, government like, you know, documents where I guess I've read like thousands and thousands of documents. Uh, you, you go back to the crime, crime prevention strategy of 1996. I can list like, you know, all kinds of like, you know, documents. But all of them arrive at the same like no conclusion to say, look, the major problem is how we are being socialized. Mm -hmm. And it is very clear, we, we, we know what are the socializing agents, be our crutches, be our schools, be our teachers, and ourselves as well, okay? So, so obviously then if we to go to the basics, is that what messages are we being given? you know, as, as, as young people. But also these young people are not getting messages from some faceless, like, you know, uh, people. They get these messages from us. So the question is, what messages, in, in, our, in our private sort of like, you no know, spaces, what messages are we delivering, okay? So obviously, the, the issue of socialization is at the center of this. And then the issue of, of paying damages, you see it in the book, that of course, when you look at it historically, with what you have said about, uh, like, you know, circumcision, uh, be the issue of, like, Lobola, they had cultural, I guess, like, no meanings, and maybe Reverend will come in in terms of their religious meanings as well. But, but of course, I mean, along the way, we need to acknowledge that things got lost. Because now, when you read the book, it becomes an impediment to other men becoming like you know, fathers. Because then you are told that and then this is an amount of money that you need to pay. And when you look at the amount, the amount is highly, highly exorbitant. No one can afford to pay uh, that like you know, amount. So it, it links with the comment that has been made, you know, to say culture is not static. We acknowledge that now we have how many people listening to this con conversation? More than 50 people. We are in different parts of the world, okay? But then we still want to hold on certain, like, you know, practices and practices and practices. And we need to acknowledge that things keep on moving and shifting. And even with what it means to be a male in the book is that it is something fluid. It's something non-static. And I agree with you, the issue of like no subjectivity has to be taken into account because I'll not want to live in a world where they're like scripts, scripts where everyone has to follow, you know, to say these scripts are mandatory and all of us need to follow these scripts because obviously that would be in conflict with the constitution, like around everyone has a right to live the life that they wish to live as long as if they are not violating other people's rights. And, and tolerance of difference, which you see in the book, when you talk about um, gay boys, for an example, you know, the constitution is very clear, despite what other people may think, you know, I mean, to say, look, I have a different, like, you no know, feeling about this. But that person constitutionally has a right to be what they are. So in conclusion, is that there has to be a room for, for difference, and, and, and we must be able to also tolerate the fact that we are not going to be the same, as long as if I'm not causing any harm to you in terms of like, you know, how I behave. Thank you, Prof Langa. 
So in, in introducing that, maybe let's talk about alternative masculinities then, since um, everything is fluid and we should be able to change as the needs require. Um, you describe alternative masculinities in the book as nonviolent, non-sexist, and non-homophobic. Um, I would maybe want to, to jump in to, and, and speak to Reverend Munyan and Dai on this, on the non-sexist non the non-homophobic elements especially where there is more females that are becoming ministers for example um and like what 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 role does patriarchy play in the church and also alternate how does the church play it I mean, i'm not sure if i'm going to be able to use the, the the right words but on homophobia and sexism and patriarchy how is the church evolving to be more accepting of this type of alternative masculine. Please unmute. Please unmute, sir. Okay. No, thank you very much, uh, Aus Dima, for, 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 for that. You, you, you know, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily want to, uh, to, 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 to box the discussion into into the church, but I just want to talk about religion in totality uh, and, and, and see how and Prof and all the panelists can, can agree with me to say uh, 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 one of the vehicle which has been used uh, to perpetuate this uh, uh, toxic demonies, it has been religion because uh, 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 South Africa, Africa, and many parts of the global south were conquered through religion. And therefore, every uh, 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 toxic behavior that got to be practiced in that particular space always came in the form of religion as a face. So now, uh, for me, to, to introduce alternative uh, masculinities, we ought to go back. Uh, maybe one person will say, no, but we can't go back. We are here now, let's, let's move forward. But for me, uh, 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 the solution to every problem is always us speaking about where we come from, agreeing on the details of the past so that we can be able to chart a way forward that is more clear and, and peaceful. So to me, it always has to be theological. We must be able to reinterpret some of the texts in the Bible. Apartheid was introduced through the Bible. Land capturing was introduced through the Bible. Everything was done, not everything, but most of the things which God or which made it possible for this, all types of these toxic hegemonies to be present in our, in our communities, they all came in a form of religion and of course other, other means. So my take on that would be to say, let's reinterpret, let's employ a, 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 a scientific interpretations which will liberate the Bible. Because everyone can take the Bible and interpret the Bible as they want. But as long as there is no hermeneutical uh, approach that can come and say, but here you applied a biblical fundamentalism. I'm sure Prof knows of that. A, an interpretation where you interpret a text on a surface value without going into context and other ways of interpretation, which is one of the very dangerous approach. And unfortunately, it has been used in, 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 in enforcing this toxic uh, masculinities. I will make an example. One person, if he or she, or if he is against a woman becoming a leader at church, 
will just quickly go and quote Paul and say, no, Paul says a woman shouldn't stand inside the church. You, you know, you, you, mm -hmm. you just interpret that text on a surface value. So I am saying for us to get rid of these tox toxicities, even in our churches, even in the society, because Africans are inherently spiritual and religious uh, uh, people. And if we want to get it right, yes, we have to employ other means, but we also have to visit the root cause or the vehicle which made our society to see a woman as a lesser or a subservient being than a man. And I am here today to say religion is not innocent in that regard. The Bible is not innocent in that regard. And those who came forward to perpetuate, to propagate, and to teach those particular uh, uh, ideals in religions were applying biblical literalism. You just look at the text and you interpret what you see without digging and excavating the text. And I'm here to say, if we were all have to go back and deeply do a thorough hermeneutical study, some mm -hmm. of those pronunciations we have made before about Paul, about Jesus, about any biblical scripture, we will be amazed to find out that they actually meant a different uh, interpretation altogether. So maybe the question that Prof and other panelists can help me with is, do we have, not pastors, but do we have theologians which are ready to come forward, conscientize the society and uh, 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 help the society to employ other means which will be able to liberate our people, not to, 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 to force them into a perpetual, you know, a, 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 a kind of a thinking where a minister will come and interpret the Bible for you, but liberate the people to ask, to approach religion with questions. And I doubt in our in our circumstances or in our context here in South Africa, we have many pastors who still dig the Bible, excavate the Bible, and take out things which a normal person wouldn't see. That is the problem, according to me, which uh, 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 we are faced with today. Thank you very much, Reverend. Um, I think a lot of, of the, when you talk about going back, it's almost as if you know how the saying goes, if you know where you come from, you'll have a better idea of where you're going. We shouldn't just take it at, at face value and run forward. We should be willing to dig deeper and understand. Thank you so much for that. We have some comments that um, I'd like to take a quick minute to read. Um, Pearl Lobize says, toxic masculinity is a huge barrier resultant from socialization. Keketo Matlebiani says, Dr. Tobani addressing the patriarchal dividend. Not all men will be able to access the full benefits of patriarchy and its cultural value, as this depends on how they display their masculinity. Usually, hypermasculinity is welcomed and praised in society. Um, let's take one or two or two more. Um, Balisa says, I like the direction the conversation is taking, addressing all the controversial issues surrounding the topic. Last one, this is big of a reverend to acknowledge. Reverend Tai, that was speaking to you. Still on alternative masculinity and socialization. Um, Mr. Tarantlaga, if we could talk of the subject where, fine, um, and in the book, there are many characters that wanted to be different. Um, and that we're uh, pursuing or trying out alternative styles and alternative masculinities, but there seemed to be a backlash from society. So there was a lot of bullying, there was a lot of labeling. Um, we touched on earlier on homosexuality, where if you, your mannerisms are more uh, feminine or a bit softer, then you're called names. Um, Mr. Taga, if you can talk to, to us about 
um, how this is how, how this affects the progress that we're trying to make by creating or, or supporting alternative masculinities. Um, maybe let me start here. So th there is this idea that um, we could survive without some sort of hierarchies, right? Um, we, which is not which is not possible. Um, if if you know, I spent some time to think about a society where there isn't somebody dominating some sort of space, right? I mean, if you're running a company, you're not going to be the same. One of you will do something better at some other thing. So, so the, the question for us is, is it possible to have a situation where somebody is not hegemonic or um, dominating the space? And I see this to, to just bring this idea that we live in a world where um, the, the, the space is, um, it's a conflicted space. So we, we are all jostling to be in, in a sense on top. So then if, if it's that space, if it, that's the case, then how do we do it? Do we do it through talking very nicely? Now we're sitting here, we're speaking English through Zoom, through technology. But if you ask the question, how did we all arrive at this point? That uh, guns uh, were used um, so some things we can talk about, but some people will be, some things will be forced. So what I'm trying to say is, is it possible to get to a place where people agree on everything or is there going to be some uncomfortability, uh, uh, a breaking of understandings or, uh, uh, so th there's a real um, wrestling that we are going to, to contend with. So if we want to talk about different masculinity, so what we have to understand is that uh, it has to be something that it is pushed for, uh, it is fought for, it is power is not, the throne is not given in a sense or negotiated. Sometimes it is something that is fought for. And then we can think of a good ways to do that. And then linked to that is the idea of models, right? We know that one of the biggest influences or the thing that influences a person is the models they have. Even now, we haven't agreed what is a, what is the ideal masculinity? Um, is, so it, would it be, as, as Prof say, somebody who's sexist, non-homophobic? Um, so is, is that the ideal? What is a good man? And I like that even Prof, how he, you know, a good, when he writes a good man, good woman, it's in um, inverted. So what is that? What is that thing? And how do we move towards that? What is this good person, this good model that we have to go towards? So, in this contested space, it is very difficult then to, to reach some sort of agreement uh, if we all don't agree on what is good, what does an ideal man look like and how does he behave, how, what's his relationship with money in a world that is very materialistic, uh, in a world uh, where people want to retire at 40. So we say, okay, but um, you don't need to be a provider, but the culture tells you that you know, you have to have goals, you have to have a side hustle. How do you negotiate that? So, so I, I think I'm bringing more, more problems than an answer. But to say that if we are going to go somewhere, there are some things we need to, 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 to admit to. to and, the, and those things are, we live in a very contested space. And it's not necessarily the, the right ideas or the ideal ideas that, that prevail, but the ones that are funded and fought for. And then we also don't agree then on what is good. And I think we should have conversations about what is the ideal. And lastly, I mean, in South Africa, most people never grew up in a family with a mom and a dad. Um, that, so how then, when we talk about then, how do we relate to each other? Uh, where do we learn that? Is it from the songs? Is it from the media? Where, where, so our models, right? So I think there's a big conversation to be had about uh, what is the right way to be? And then, then we need to fight for that. I think essentially that's what uh, I'd like to, to, to enter there. What is the right way to be? And then how are we going to fight for that? We still don't agree on that point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Taka. On the subject of models, uh, Professor Amaluse Langa, um, and who the, the, the young boys look up to and who they see, there are characters in the book that have both families, many are raised by mainly their mothers, um, and their role models are either extended family or people in society. Um, from a township 
perspective. And um, Dr. Matlo Honolo, when, when, when we get to it, maybe you could also add on your experience there. There are uh, situations where young men look up to the criminals and the gangsters and the likes in, in, the, in the society because that is the version of success that they get to see. They are the guys with the money, they are the guys with the, with the girls and everything else. So on the subject of, of models, if a, a boy child is raised in a household that does not have a father, either due to death or he ran away, or he is there but not there. How does that affect uh, a boy child? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Dimagats. You know, um, I mean, I guess a lo lot of things get get said, and then you're asking me a question, and and I still want to respond what other <laughs> panelists have, have have said. It's, we, it's, it's also the, the time you, you know, know everything <laughs> in so so and i and i and i i and i hope i mean obviously as a as a host we'll, we have to come back um we, we we really have to come back and 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 be more focused because now i'm 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 very frustrated because i feel like we're trying to cover like you know, almost like you know, everything um but let me let me be quick i mean because in each and every conversation uh there's a discourse what reverend was saying what tabang was saying what i'm saying what matrawanole is saying what our our i mean the guests are also like you know saying through their written like you know uh, messages it's all discourses and discourses and and you can see that the the, the truths are like you no know, competing it's, it's the contestation that tabang was like you know referring to you know to say this is the view this is the view this is the view and this is the view and even with like you know, your questions like around boys that grew up with like you no know, fathers or did not grow up with fathers and they need to have money and money means this and it's it's all the discourses and the discourses mm -hmm. and remember a, a discourse can be religious in nature can be cultural in nature i can give a psychological discourse and and i see that as the truth and what our guests are saying is the truth but for me fundamentally what we need to agree on and and the best document to refer to it would be the universal declaration of like no human rights mm -hmm. because obviously that document old as it is it emerged out of particular historical epoch epoch of saying uh, in the context of world war ii okay you know to say the, the, there's a need to agree on, on certain principles. Principles that you can be who you are, but you need to res respect my liberties. You need to, you need to respect like, you know, my being. Um, but there's no way we can have this conversation, and, and I know I'm not answering your question, have this conversation without a reference to bigger systems. Bigger systems such as economic like you know, systems mm. because all of us now have become actors within this capitalist like you know, society mm. you know to say a certain truth must be celebrated and be honored and you see this through the stories of this like you know, young boys that to be a boy you ought to have money okay in the book, there's a picture of like an APSA where this boy took a picture of like an APSA. And obviously, APSA represented like no money. And money meant access to this. And obviously, when you see TV programs, this is what you're being told, that you need to have a lot of money, you need to hustle. And, and as a result of this, we are in so much pain when we feel we do not have enough money. And you see this in the stories of like no, some of these like no young boys feeling or oh, the blazers are taking all our girls and we are left with like you no know, nothing and we need to sort of like you know, aspire and then we'll go to my to my talk on all like around guys that then get involved in the cash and cash and heist like you no know, transit you know and when you look at that it, it's also about the inequalities of our country and i'll, I'll leave it there because i just feel there's so much to cover but let me give my talk on all an opportunity to chip in Dr. Um, 
Thank you very much, Prof. Um, yeah, I just feel like I'm also feeling the same. There's like this time we don't have enough time and we're trying to cover everything. But anyway, I want to, before I tap into what Prof was, Prof was discussing now, go back to your question about when I mentioned the issue of detraditionalization of our social norms that um, will it not be subjective. But um, I think Tabang also mentioned something very important about you know, um, socialization. Um, remember, these norms are created by the society. So meaning that if we are to detraditionalize or if we are to change some of these toxic masculinities, it has to be a collective effort. So, you know, when I do my research on gender-based violence, um, the answer that I get all the time um, about the issue of GBV that we have in our country is that for as long as um, every single person who lives in this country has not made GBV their problem, then there will be no solution to gender-based violence. So it's exactly the same about masculinities because it's a societal construct. The um, prof also speaks about, you know, the hegemonic masculinities being static, not being static, I mean being fluid. They're not, you know, so meaning that as time goes by, we need to change. The ref spoke about history. If we want to change this harmful social norms, we have to go back to history and then unlearn what we have told, what we have been told, and relearn new things. You know, the issue of provision, for example, Tabang spoke about it. Provision has to be negotiated also. You know, the thing that man is, the man is a provider. Yes, it's fine, it's a positive thing, but it cannot be the same as 50 years ago. 50 years ago, I would stay at home and not work, and my husband would have to go to work and work, right? And provide for me or for his family. But right now, I work, he works. So me and my husband need to sit down and renegotiate the issue of provision. That actually provision in this day and age no longer means monetary value. As a man, you can still provide in other ways besides money. As a man, if you are not able to provide your family with money, you should not feel less of a man because you do not have money. So um, that's basically what they, so we need to unlearn and relearn and we have to reconstruct some of these social norms. Um, so then I want to tap in on the issue of role modeling. Um, so Prof spoke about the research that I did um, on cash and transit highs. So I, um, in 2014, I conducted a study on cash and transit highs um, and I interviewed 40 men in prison and basically my study was on their criminal career. What I wanted to find out was four things. When they started committing the crime, um, why they continued committing the crime, if the crimes became more serious, if they escalated, and then the last thing I wanted to find out that if one, if you stop committing a crime, then why do you stop committing a crime? But I'll look at the first one and not go through everything else, I'll go through I'll, I'll talk you through onset, which is when a person be, um, starts committing crime. So most of the guys that I spoke to in the prison, which was 40, they said that they actually, the reason why they started committing crime is because the people that they look up to in the community as role models, as people who are successful, were people who were committing crime. The people who were living the high lifestyle, the fleshy lifestyle, People who have money, you know that ATM prof in the book, you know, mm -hmm. um, it shows yeah. that, you know, you desire to have money because you are seeing people in the community um, having money, people who are crim and you are looking up to those people. And the community tells you that as a man, for you to be able to qualify as a mm -hmm. man, you need mm -hmm. to have money. And then the other thing that prof speaks about here, because he speaks about, um, you know, hegemonic masculinities, um, like I said, like there are multiple, you know, there's multiple masculinities. You have the guys who are good guys. Prof speaks about like academics. He speaks about, you know, um, the guys um, who are Christian, um, but those guys are actually told that they are not men enough. 
because they're not engaging in violent and risky behavior. And then you've got um, the other uh, type of hegemonic masculinities, which is the guys who are the totties, um, and then the guys who are engaging in sex with multiple girlfriends. So when I interviewed um, the guys in the prison also, and I asked them that, okay, after you've committed this crime and you have the loot, what do you do with it? And they said that, no, they splash it. They, they basically squander it. And um, they have like multiple girlfriends that they spend this money on, um, buy fancy cars, buy flashy clothes, because that, is, that defines you as a man, right? In the, in, in the township. Then people will be like, yeah, you are the man because you've got money, you've got multiple girlfriends. And it's the same thing that these findings were also found in this book also where Prof says that um, these guys, the Tzotis, are the guys who are actually more praised in the, in, the, in, the, in the township, you know? And if you're a good boy, you are ostracized as not being man enough. So it's exactly what I saw um, also in the prison when I was interviewing the 40 guys. And this is what, why I said in the beginning that, you know, toxic mascul masculinities are actually, um, the, the masculinities that actually are, are violent, you know, um, they encourage a person to uh, participate in risky behavior. And they're not only bad for the society, but they're also bad to you as a human being. Because also, for example, let's look at norms such as a man doesn't cry. And this is where Mr. Chaka and Professor, because they're psychologists, will also come in and support me that um, you know, these notions that you are not men enough if you don't cry can lead to a man. A lot of men are going through uh, mental health issues because they've been taught that as a man, or something like that. So if you're a man and you cry, you'll be shunned. You are not masculine enough. You are not men enough. So you need to be mature, you need to be violent in order for you to be celebrated, in order for you to be told that you are the man. So yeah, role modeling is, is really, um, like I said in the beginning um, of, 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 of this um, engagement that society, like the, the society needs to be involved in this whole detraditionalizing of the social norms because the norms are formed by the society. We learn from the society. We've got like in psychology and criminology, we've got what is called the social learning theory. So that theory basically says that, you know, behavior, even criminal behavior, it's a cognitive process that happens in the context of the society. So that is why a society plays a very powerful role in many problems that we have actually in this country, many ills that we have in this country, the solution lies in the society itself. And this is basically what this book is trying to say that, you know what, it's trying to teach men to unlearn and relearn healthy and alternative masculinities. So Thank yeah, I want so to talk so more, but yeah, anyway, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I wish we had all day to talk about yeah. this because it's yeah. a lot to unpack. But fortunately, um, there is the book Becoming Men. Uh, Professor Malusi, if you can tell us where can we get this book? How much is it? Um, and while you tell us that, I'm going to open for Q&As. There's at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. Please put all your questions there because you're all interacting nicely on chat. I don't want them mixed up. If you want them directed at a specific specific um, panelists put their name on there so we know who to take it to but Prof Langa where do we get the book how much is it I mean the the, the book is is available at different uh, bookshops uh, including exclusive books um, capital uh, bookshop bargaining bookshop and also on Amazon and, and take a lot and you can also reach out to Vets uh, Press. Perfect, thank you very much. We will look at a few questions at this point. Tekon Siari says, what is masculinity without providing or protecting? 
I'm not sure if that is a, a question or a comment, but how can you define masculinity without having to use the words providing and protecting? Anyone on the panel that would like to take that one? Mr. Tlaga? What is masculinity without providing or protecting? I'm interested in the prof's answer. Okay, <laughs> prof, <laughs> he threw the ball right at you. <laughs> Please unmute. Uh, I mean, oh, oh. Obviously, I think um, Matlo Onolo did did answer this this question like you know, very well, um, and and I guess also the the Reverend I'll I'll throw it back at the Reverend <laughs> that 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 obviously I mean there are all these like you no know, constructs and sort of like you no know, expectations, and and some I guess are cultural in nature, traditional in nature, but the 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 worry I guess is the the point that Matlo Onolo sort of like you no know, made. You know, to say when you go back to the simple definition of like no hegemonic like no masculinity is that a man has to be a provider. Mm. Okay, fast forward, we have COVID nineteen now, and and obviously it has resulted or is going to result in massive like no job job losses. Mm. In in two thousand eight, we we had a global financial like no crisis. It it has led to massive like no job job losses. You, you go back to the history of this like no country post like post 1994 we, we had gear 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 policy and obviously i mean we have different economies some praising it you know but at the heart of it is that not all men are able to like no provide so does it mean that men who are not able to provide they're not real real men and 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 of course, I mean, it it it's it, it's it's a burden. It's a burden that we need to uh, sort of like you know, I guess, like you know, challenge and and challenge, because even in cases of like you know, femicide, uh, this is what 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 we hear. Uh, 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 this person said, I'm 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 not man enough, you know, because I'm not able to do like you no know, one two three four, and you have men then taking risks. I mean, many of the participants in my Tlokonolo like you know study because I also work in, in, in prison. The common theme that we hear is the question of money and money. You know, and, and David David and Baranon identified, I guess what they call the typologies of what it means to be a man. Okay. Mm. And I'll mention some of them. No CC stuff, meaning as a man you cannot cry. Mm. A big will. A big will is that you need to have a big house, you need to have a big car. And that's what it means to be a man. Uh, give him a hell. Give him a hell is that the only emotion that you can express is that of anger, okay? Mm -hmm. Stuck oak. Stuck oak, it means you must be stoic at, at all the time and you must always be in charge, you must always be in, in control, okay? But if you look at the flip side of all these like, you know, typologies, you see the other side of what it means to be a man that it is very costly and very, very costly. Thank you for that, Prof. Uh, Tepo Rachidi says, how do we address this issue of all men are trash? There seems to be a narrative of attacking all men and making all men to be in support of the abuse of women across the social media. Does this idea help the cause? Um. Can I, can I take that one? Definitely. Yeah, um, so for, for me, I think, um, I mean, I, I said with different individuals, people who are abusing, you know, and, and so you, you get to look at it from that other side as well. But if somebody has been abused, right? Uh, so you look at the abuser and the abused. If somebody has been abused, you have to understand that they go through a certain process, right? They, they, the, the trauma that happens to a person, uh, how they now need to understand themselves, the violation they have. So, and part of that is when people get very upset, people get livid and, and angry about what has happened to them. And therefore certain things can be said at that point in time, right? And so for me, I think sometimes as, as I suppose as men, we get offended with that um, saying, you know, men are trash. And, but I think we have to appreciate when people have been through trauma and there's a certain response 
that people will have. Whether it's helpful or not, that's a different question, right? And so even in the book, there's the idea of when violence comes about, right? And violence also comes about when there's shame and rejection, right? Mm -hmm. So part of what we are also doing and as a society, we are, there's this label that I suppose if you're a boy or a man, you must carry. You have to carry the sins of your father, the sins of your brother, the sins of whatever men did and whatever is bad about society, then you have to carry this label. And I think I, men are trash, uh, men are dogs. Though I understand where that comes from, I think we ought to be careful how we label people and, and how they interpret that. Because part of the, the, interp the interpretation is, well, if, if I'm trash, then therefore that, that's, there's a certain way trash behaves. So mm -hmm. I'd like us to be very careful about actually the boy child and the messages that we are sending to little boys. Um, you know, I, I was listening to an interview. Uh, a gentleman said that um, uh, they were marching and, and, he, and, and he was saying he, he can't accept this men are trash label, right? And then he says, but how can I say that to my son? If I, how, what, so if I say I'm trash, what do I tell him, right? And, but, so I want to say, but we need to understand if there's hurt, certain things might be said, and perhaps discussions like this, perhaps we can find, we, we can call a spade a spade, but we can find also useful ways uh, to redirect behavior, to encourage um, it's how to model it properly. So for me, um, I understand where it comes from, but I think there are, there are, there are ways we can do it. Maybe it's helpful in that it brings awareness, but it's got a negative side to it in that if, if people accept that about themselves, um, because we move towards the things that are constantly repeated. Um, so whatever is repeated, that's what we become. And so we ought to be careful with that, with our little boys. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tag. We're going to take two more questions. We have one from Lerato Cabo. Uh, she says, are there specific tools that we can give to our young boys to make sure they are better people in society? Some people feel only the father can, but what about the mother? And Prof Langa, you speak about this in the book, about the influences that mothers have, and it's also uh, something that you touch on quite extensively. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, it, the the issue of being being a, a role model cannot be limited to like you know one 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 gender. But I guess if I were to focus this on 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 boy children because that's what we're discussing today, it, it, it is to is to help them. You know, um, how do you become kind? How do you become like you no know, gentle? How do you cry when you feel hurt? And basically, it's like how do you become like a normal human being and 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 stop wearing this like you know facade of needing to be tough, needing to be strong, because at the end that becomes like you no know, very costly. And this can be done by teachers at school, can be done by mothers, can be done by like you no know, cousins. And 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 I've I've debunked this like you no know, notion that boy children always need fathers and you see it in the book that the the 19 boys that grew up without their fathers but they were they were able to become different like you no know, men uh, b b i guess because of the conversations that we had you know and i'm not their father and i'm not their brother i was just like someone whom i accidentally sort of like you no know, met and and because we were able to have this like you no know, conversations, they were able to become like you no know, different. Meaning, and and some they make reference to to their mothers and to their aunts. And it's scientific; is the truth. Thank you, Prof. Um, the last question is from Gwena Mahoga. She says. Are the issues projected in the conversation black issues? If yes, how does p poverty contribute to the process of self-empowerment or community development? Let's give that to the Reverend. <laughs> Reverend, the question is, are the issues projected in the conversation black issues? If yes, how does poverty contribute to the process of self-empowerment or community development? 
is from Gwena Mahuk. I will also add after the, the Reverend. Um, Thank you, Dr. Tobani. Okay, I'm okay now. Yes, perfect. Okay. No, uh, I think I think as 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 the latter speakers have rightfully said uh, uh, and put their point on the table, it's it's more or less uh, uh, giving a bigger uh, a picture and also an answer to to the question of 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 that you have uh, actually posed to me now. Now, uh, all, 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 all the township. I'll, I'll constantly refer to the township uh, uh, because I don't want to deviate from the the book that much because it was focusing on the township of Alexandra, and and as you might know, uh, uh, one of the themes which uh, comes to the table when you talk about Alex. It's, 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 it's the, the, the theme of poverty. And even those boys which a uh, prof might have had an interaction with, some of them have made it, some of them, I think one is in jail, some of them uh, 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 are somewhere. Uh, when, you, when you check at the, at the gist of their upbringing, it has been surrounded by poverty. So uh, many of these black issues, I don't want to label them as black issues uh, because uh, uh, poverty does not only affect uh, the black population. In, even in the global South, your Brazil and your, some of the Asian countries, they are being uh, uh, stricken by this poverty. But if we want to speak about the township issues, poverty, is always at the center of all these developments. Uh, if you have to look at why did this boy have to commit a, a robbery or have to steal or kill, uh, 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 it's, it, it is the issue of wanting to become like somebody. So uh, 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 you can't speak about uh, becoming a man in the context of a locacy without exploring the issue of, 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 of poverty. I would make an example. When we grew up, uh, 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 we were being influenced by Kwaito, by Kwaito music. And when you are being influenced by Kwaito, there's a certain way you should wear, and there's a, there's a certain tal you should pronounce, and there's a certain walk you should, you should be seen walking. And when you walk, talk, and do all those, when you, when you start to embody all those uh, aspects which you saw in the media space, there's a certain action which you, you then need to commit because you can't seem quite to be a soft, a, a spoken type of a guy. No, it doesn't happen. You can't put a chain. You can't put a DMD. During our days, we, we used to have a DMD. Uh, I'm sure Prof also saw that in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the interaction with the boys. It's a sporty. They call it a morachino in the, in the township town. It is a DMD. <laughs> And it has flowers. It's a, it's a skipper that has got flowers and a sport. So once you wear those particular clothes, there are certain norms which you are then expected to do. But if you check at the gist of the matter, you will find that those norms which you are then uh, expected to do are the norms which, uh, according to the society, are the ones which are supposed to uh, 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 take you out of poverty. So it was believed that you can come out of poverty or you can come out of inequalities that we see in the locuses 
without falling into that group of of boys and i saw even prof uh, in the book also covered uh, uh, covered that aspect i for one when i came to do ministry many people at school were afraid of me to say no 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 you can't be murudi you are from soweto you can't do that even today when you explain that no i'm from soweto i may i may i may i may i may i may, I may reverend it, it there's there's always those con societal connotations or expectations which even prof at the at the beginning of the book says uh, the reason why he wrote the book he wanted to explore those assumptions which are normally given to those people who come from the township so i think each and every crime that is committed by the by the adolescent boys in the township at the end of the day if you want to check why is this crime committed the answer will be i wanted to come out of poverty i wanted to be a better person i wanted to become like a a a a, a, a boobies a prof we used to have a boobies boobies was a person in our i grew up in dube boobies was the only person in dube who could make the police cars and the aeroplane and go around so wait without them being able to 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 catch him and when we saw that when we saw the 3255 as the bmw because even today if you go and uh, excavate the understanding behind why is it that township boys love bmws you will always find that this bmw is closely connotated with becoming a a township hero but in a more of a negative light in a in a in a in a, in a risky behavior so i think each and everything which tends to happen in 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 the township to the to the to the viewer at home who asked the question the the, the answer or the center of everything is always poverty mm. um can i just Thank add to you that? yes um so in the in the um yeah definitely like um you know it's also explained in the book when um prof explains that you know these hegemonic masculinities are also intersectional you know um like you can't um discuss the one thing separate from the other so just like reverend said poverty definitely plays a big role and you know obviously um uh, this book or our discussion of of the black boy in the township so in my research what i found is that almost all the guys that i interviewed the reason why they committed the crimes or the cash and transit heist they said firstly it was because of the need for money um so what also happened what also happened is that because they were the first born boys in their family who did not have their fathers present either uh, due to death or due to their fathers neglecting them they then were automatically expected to assume the role of a father and a father is supposed to be a provider so most of them would even drop out of school so that they can go by lozola to provide for their families so poverty obviously plays a big role although um reverend also just emphasized that it is not the only reason why a person commits crime but it is one of the contributing factors why a person would go out there to go and commit a crime especially a crime like cash and transit where a person would say that the need was specifically money because i needed to provide for my family so poverty does play um a role in all of us thank you very much dr tobani we are out of time um I, we're gonna go for closing comments um and in the closing comments i would really think um, a lot of us have been here for an hour and a half now. Time flies when you're having fun. Uh, but if you can keep it nice and tight, nice and short. Um, and my, my last question in your closing comment, if you could just help us so we know um, what to do after this is, 
what can we do to support the men in our lives to become better men? So if each one of you could answer that in addition to your closing comment. We'll start with Mr. Tabanklaga. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm still on that point that I think we have to get to a point where we, we, we have a picture of what is ideal. And therefore we can teach people to go towards that. Until we don't agree on what's an ideal, I think we're going to have different ideas, right? And I think one of the, the other things is, but we, we need to, our modeling is very important that people don't just um, grow up in a vacuum. So we need to have the, the example so that men can have these examples to follow from. And I think if we can start there, then we'll, we'll have some direction to move towards. Thank you very much, Mr. Taka, and thank you for your contribution today. It was really valuable. Dr. Matafanolo Uh For me, as the other woman on the panel, uh, what I would like to leave with the men um, who are listening and the men of the panel, I'm very happy about today. And um, I've, I've been thinking, and I think a lot of us who are working in the space uh, of gender-based violence, the issue has been that why we cannot prevent gender-based violence by asking the victim to try not to be victimized, you know? by asking the victim to behave a certain way so you don't become a victim. That's not a preventative method. We need the perpetrator, who's mostly the man, to be told that it is not okay, you know, to disrespect a woman. It is not okay to um, commit a crime against a, a woman. So I'm, I'm happy because this conversation and many other conversations that we are going to have, we've been missing this. We've been missing men in this space. We've been missing men who are actively say that we want to be part of the solution. And I think that's what the book is about, you know, to ask men to step forward and be part of the solution of the gender-based violence issue that we have in this country. So I'm happy that we had men today to talk about these issues so that other men out there can also follow. And I think then we are heading in the right direction where we are not only just focusing on the victim, but we are speaking to the perpetrators also. Thank you very much, Dr. Matlokonolo and all the best with the project you're working on, on local governance to improve gender-based violence response. Thank you for your contribution today. Reverend Munyan Intai, any closing comments? Oh, okay. No, let me also just uh, thank uh, the platform and also to thank our prof uh, for, for giving us uh, this important space to indulge uh, on the issues that are, are, are more or less at, at our backyards. Uh, and we, 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 we experience them daily. But for me, just to, just to uh, uh, in closing, I would, I, would, I would really like to say that, uh, and it was said by our, 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 our doctor as well to say, any efforts that we employ to combat uh, this tox uh, toxic hegemonic masculinities, uh, it should be a collective effort. Mm -hmm. uh, it should be a societal effort. Mm -hmm. uh, it should be a media effort. Uh, because I know what a media can do to young boys who are growing in the township. Uh, it should be a religious uh, a business and, and, and a religious effort, and also a, a curriculum, a curriculum uh, uh, effort. If all these societal or these spaces of influence in our society do not come together, Nothing is going to work. And the point was clearly raised earlier by, 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 by one of the speakers to say, uh, 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 it, it won't help if it is only a, a business of a particular group of people. The minute we make it our business, your business, and their business, that's when now we are, we are, we are going to start to see 
uh, 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 the fruit of becoming. And I also like the title uh, of our professor. We are in the journey of becoming. No one can say we have arrived. I am a man. Uh, and therefore, let me teach other men what it means to be a man. No, we are becoming. It's a continuous journey that uh, we, are, we, are, we are engaging in. So with those words, I, I, I just want to say that uh, let us continue uh, engaging and persuading each other otherwise and, 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 and teaching our people as to how uh, we see and uh, uh, view the future concerning all these uh, 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 toxic masculinities in our society. Thank you very much, Banabe uh, Subarateha. Thank you, Reverend Ta, and thank you for your amazing contributions to the conversation today. Last but not least, Prof Malusi Langa, what are your closing comments? I mean, in, in closing, th thanks very much, Dimagato, uh, for having organized this like a conversation and and also the invitation to my fellow like no panelists and and i hope this was just like an introduction and we'll have more other series of these discussions you know because i'm i'm of the view that there's a lot that we need to sort of like no cover and and maybe in our next like no conversation we'll, we'll try and be more more specific uh, our men trash and 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 we spend an hour like you know discussing that and the the model that like you know tabang like you know spoke spoke about we 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 spend an hour you know the issue of uh, our men like you no know, providers you know so so I'm, so I'm hoping you you're going to read all this like you no know, comments and then develop like you no know, themes and and invite i guess like you no know, different like you no know, people who will be experts in the themes that would have like you no know, identified so what i'm drawing out of this like you no know, conversation it is it is quite evident that being a man is is costly mm -hmm. uh, and and in fact the stats show that in south africa 40, 46 men die every day as a result of like no violence every day and this is not known to the public and this as a as a result of what you call male homicide male homicide where men kill each other 46 men die in this country and and many of these killings obviously are rooted with notions of what it means to be a male so I'm of the view to say change is possible, and you're able to see this in, 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 in the book, that despite the fact that these young men grew up in LX, they were able to be different men today through the conversations that I had with them. Mm -hmm. And I hope through this platform, we can have many other conversations. And we'll be waiting for emails from Amari, uh, like, you know, marketing of new platforms. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof Langa, especially for this book. Um, I, I've read it. I enjoyed it. It's very relevant. It will really, you'll find value. All of us should hold up our books now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you all for welcoming us and, and welcoming us into your homes. Thank you for spending this time with us. I know it's a Friday evening and you could have been anywhere else, but thank you for being here. I'd like to close with a comment um, from Ms. Vene Raja, and I thought this was the perfect way to close this off. She says, Prof Langa, I'm, I'm reminded of a quote by Haki Bakande, which says, you become a man not when you reach a certain age, but rather when you reach a certain state of mind. So thank you, Ms. Raja, for that. Um, and have an amazing, amazing weekend. Prof Langa, challenge accepted about that series. We'll see each other soon. Good night. Good night. Thank you.